Hello, everyone, and welcome to Maine Audubon's Spring 2024, Winter 2024. I, let's be optimistic and call it spring. The second session of the 131st Maine Legislature, our priorities webinar. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Nick Lund. I'm Maine Audubon's advocacy and outreach manager. I am joined by Francesca Chess Gundrum, as we all know, our policy associate, the one who is doing the the hardest work you guys could ever imagine right now, passing laws to protect Maine's wildlife and habitat. She sped down from the state house moments ago. Her car is probably still idling and parked crooked in the driveway as she dashed. You're not inside. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the session is underway right now. We are going great guns, um, but we wanted to make sure that we took a moment to talk to our members, our friends out there across Maine, all the way to Northern Virginia and beyond to tell you about uh, what we're working on. What are the things that Chess mostly is up there in Augusta uh, fighting for uh, right now, this week and in the next couple of weeks and for the months um, to protect Maine wildlife and wildlife habitat. So Chess, hello, how are you? Doing well, you're not wrong, crooked car, but I'm here <laughs> and present and really excited to talk with you all today about some awesome priorities that we're working on up at the state house. All right. Before we uh, turn it over to you, I will just do, we've all been on these Zoom webinars by now. We all know the drill, but I will cover it because I'm contractually obligated to. Um, Q, we are going to, uh, we're going to start with uh, a little recap of what we worked on in the first session of the legislature. Uh, and so we're going to go do that. Then we're going to pause for some questions if folks have them in the middle. If you have questions, please type them down below. If you look on the bar on the lower part of the screen, there's a thing that says Q and A. And type your questions right in there, then um, them come directly to Chess and I, that way, that way we won't lose them in the chat or anything. That's the best way to do that. We'll pause halfway for questions and we'll talk in the, the bulk of the thing, the second half about um, what we're right, working on right now, our priorities this session. Um, that's about it. Uh, we're recording, this will be available uh, on YouTube tomorrow if you wanna pass it on to friends and family. Um, I think that's all. And without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Jess. Thanks, Nick, as always, for the wonderful introduction. Hopefully you're seeing the right screen. I'm going to go with yes, thumbs up. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to get right to it because there's so much good stuff to talk about um, today. And before I really dig into the highlights from last session and then what we're working on this session, I wanted to take a minute to just frame us up a little bit and introduce you once more to our advocacy department at Maine Audubon. So we advocate on behalf of public policies that are in the best interest of Maine's wildlife and wildlife habitat. And we do that at the local level. Here's at Nick again, working on some bird state stuff right in Portland, which we'll talk about later. Um, at the state level, that is the focus of today's um, webinar is what we do up in Augusta to conserve wildlife and wildlife habitat and beyond. We also um, work at the federal level as well. I was up in um, DC this um, fall working on some Endangered Species Act um, um, uh, legislation. And with that, framing once more, um, a reminder that our approach, our department's approach is science-based, it's inclusive, it's measured, and it relies on you, our members, our supporters, our volunteers, and beyond that are really the secret to successful advocacy. Um, so we can't do what we do without you. So with that, again, thanks so much for being here. And I'm going to jump in to reminding us once more of what our focus areas are before I jump into the highlights a full range of things. And we're actually adding more as we go here. Um, but we work on issues related to climate change, habitat connectivity, plastic pollution, endangered and threatened species, and beyond. Um, and we work in collaboration with a lot of different partners across the state, because we know that we do our best work when we do it together. Um, so we work with education groups, we work with environmental and social justice groups, we work with climate groups, uh, environmental and public health and conservation groups and beyond. So that's sort of the framing is that we're not up there doing the work alone. We do it with um, some really impressive and wonderful folks who are just as dedicated as we are. Um, and we do that work together. Um, so last session, the 131st legislature had its first session in 2023. So what we're gonna do here is just give you big picture, some of the uh, numbers 
of um, the big highlights from, from last year. So we submitted testimony on 56 bills. That was more bills than we ever have in our department's history, which is exciting. Um, we're really happy about the growth and the directions that we're going. Um, we, you, our members, supporters, et cetera, submitted more than 3,600 messages to legislators. Um, and you did that when it was a timely moment that we needed our legislators to know that they had that we wanted them to vote in favor or in opposition to a bill that's a priority of ours and hopefully a priority of yours as well. And then finally, we also had our largest petition ever that we submitted to a legislative committee, which was more than a thousand folks signed a petition to help expand protections to common loons from lead poisoning. And I'm going to just put a pin in that and explain more about that bill right now, because um, that was a big focus for me last session. So I'm going to do a little bit of a, a dive onto LD-958. Um, so this was the lead tackle bill, and um, lead poisoning remains one of the leading causes of death for adult loons in um, Maine. Loons will pick up lost or discarded fishing tackle at the bottom of lakes and ponds. Um, they'll also eat it, um, ingest um, tackle that's stuck in fish. And when they ingest that lead-based tackle, they ultimately become poisoned, and within two to four weeks, um, they end up dying. And that death is brutal. Uh, they have seizures, their wings droop, they have trouble vocalizing. Um, and um, this is a picture of a loon that washed up in 2019 um, up in Belgrade. And we did a really great job 10 years ago of trying to close some, um, uh, to address this issue and um, make it so that the use and sale of lead-based small-sized fishing tackle um, is not allowed in Maine. But there was a loophole that maintained in that law that co uh, painted small-sized jigs were allowed, but we know that the paint does nothing to help protect loons from lead poisoning now. So we worked really hard to close that loophole and make it so that painted jigs were also included. And we did it. So we got 40 folks to submit testimony. Again, that massive um, petition um, was super helpful. So thank you if you signed on or, or um, you heard about it. This was really, really great. We got bipartisan co-sponsorship and votes, agency support from our wildlife agency. And I got to watch in the House and then in the Senate as this thing passed, which was really exciting, running back and forth um, across the, the halls at the State House. And um, we got a ceremonial signing from Governor Mills for this legislation as well. Um, in red there on the left is Representative Allison Hepler, who is the sponsor of this bill. Um, we're so grateful for, for her support and everything she did to help get it across the finish line. And then um, also right there is Rep Hassenfuss, um, who has a lot of lakes in his district. And um, actually, his oldest daughter is named Gavia which if that's sparking anything for birders on the call, Gavia Immer is the scientific name for loon. So he had an extra investment in this legislation. So it was really fun to work with both of them. I won't spend as much time on the other bills as this one, um, but um, just wanted to give you sort of a full range of, of, of what we did to accomplish this priority for us. We also passed LD57, which is a bill that added eight new species to Maine Endangered Species Act list. Uh, when a uh, species gets added to that list, it means that they get the resources and the attention that they need in order to bring them back from the brink of extinction. So it's an incredible tool um, that we have and we do everything we can to make it stronger and to make sure that those species that need those protections get on that list. And that's what we did last session. So we added the salt marsh sparrow, Bicknell's thrush, um, uh, cliff swallow, black pole warbler, bank swallows, margin tiger beetle, and rusty patch bumblebee, and the tricolored bat. Um, so we got those eight um, on the list. And thankfully, because of a wonderful representative, Sally Clushy, we were also able to add to that legislation that instead of checking on species lists every eight, year, or every eight years to see what species we need to add, we now are doing it on a four-year cycle, which is way um, more appropriate for the scale at which we are seeing habitat, or excuse me, population shifts for um, species, especially those that are um, are threatened and are getting close to that threatened and endangered mark. So um, kudos to Representative Clushy. Um, on the endangered and threatened species habitat thread here, we also passed a bill to make it um, so that um, 
our natural resource agencies are required to um, consult with each other more so to avoid and minimize impacts to endangered and threatened species habitat. So this was sort of an, an oversight in one of our most important environmental protection laws. Um, so we were able to add number four there. Again, this is kind of blurry, but this is this is what it looks, a lot of my work looks like, <laughs> is looking in the weeds of definitions, et cetera, and thinking about what I can add so that all that underlined there is um, added. Um, so that was great. So um, that was a huge effort um, to make sure that those development pressures, et cetera, um, that are encroaching on in, um, endangered and threatened species habitat are better protected and um, our agencies are working to can do their best work. Um, a fun one, LD239 established a state butterfly, the pink edge sulfur. This um, was a fun surprise bill and we cannot take credit for this. This was put forward by two really enthusiastic fifth graders from Old Orchard Beecher's LaRanger Middle School who were working on a class project about um, state wildlife, state birds, state insects, and thought, huh, Maine doesn't have a state butterfly. Let's do something about that. And so they reached out to um, their state representative, another environmental um, champion, Representative Lori Gramlich, about establishing a state butterfly and working with our state wildlife agency and um, having us in the room to support, um, they were able to get it done. And it was a really exciting and momentous day. And this is one of those bills that clearly you can see how much I'm smiling. It just brings us a lot of joy and it helps marry a lot of what we do at Maine Audubon and specifically in our mission of making sure that that education and advocacy and conservation pieces all flow together. So we love to see um, kids getting engaged um, at at all levels. So this was wonderful. And we got to watch Governor Mills sign this bill into law as well. And I also, at the time, one of these fifth graders had a broken arm. So Governor Mills also signed his cast. So it was quite the day for this, <laughs> for this young kiddo. So exciting stuff. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Nick to talk about the next three highlights. Yeah, let me jump in here for a second just to give Chess a breather. I, guess I hope we get some water because she'll be going hard in the second half too. And I do see a, a great question in the question in a box. Um, we'll get to that uh, when we uh, wrap up these bills quickly. But uh, for other folks, if you have questions now about what Chess has said so far, please put them in there and we'll get to them in a few minutes. While I talk about LD 1895, this was a huge bill that we passed. We worked, uh, and I must give a lot of kudos to our colleague, uh, Eliza Donahue. Actually, we haven't mentioned Eliza yet so far. Our beloved director of advocacy um, left recently to take over a job at the Maine Renewable Energy Association as their executive director. Um, we miss her dearly. She's great, uh, but we're doing great. Uh, um, but uh, Eliza was a powerhouse behind this bill here, which took a lot of work. Um, it uh, deals with offshore wind. Um, we need to act on climate change, period. And offshore wind in the, the in the Gulf of Maine presents an incredible opportunity to generate a ton, a ton, a ton of clean local electric power. And but we need to make it happen. And there are things we got to do uh, to facilitate um, it going on. The first is a procurement, or, or or very important important is a procurement, which is a commitment from the state to buy power that is derived offshore. So the the one of the main thrusts of 1895 was a three gigawatt procurement uh, requirement. Uh, from the state of Maine for offshore wind. Um, that's fantastic. Um, but there, there's a lot of other great um, pieces in 1895. The idea here is that, you know, Maine doesn't own the Gulf of Maine, right? Maine uh, only owns three miles out from our shorelines. Everything else is owned by the federal government. And so states are sort of in competition for each other to get offshore wind, to be able to control and have a say in how offshore wind is, is developed because we don't own the land. Um, but we want to have really strong standards. So Maine came out and said, yes, we will uh, procure this energy, but we're going to put some strong standards in it. We don't want it in, for example, LMA1, Lobster Management Area 1, which is where uh, most all 99% of the lobstering occurs off the Gulf. We want to avoid those impacts. Uh, we want to have um, strong labor standards and environmental standards. We want to have research involved to understand what might the environmental impacts uh, and wildlife impacts of offshore wind be in the Gulf and how we can mitigate those. All of those things were included in 1895, and it was a, a huge lift. And so now we're, we're moving ahead. Um, so we're going to be a long process, but one very much worthwhile when we can get turbines in the water. Now let's go to my next one. 
Okay, this is a, a uh, very exciting one to me personally. A few years ago, um, I helped start a program at Maine Audubon called Bird Safe Maine, which works to raise awareness about bird glass collisions in Maine. Um, it sounds niche, perhaps, but this is a, uh, a huge problem for birds across the country. About a billion birds die per year in the United States alone from colliding with glass windows. One billion. Um, it's a big problem, and we've worked um, a really great partnership uh, in Maine to help raise awareness with the University of Southern Maine, Portland Society for Architecture, a whole ton of volunteers. And um, we've talked with tons of architects. We've done a lot of work to um, get folks to understand what this problem is and how they can avoid it. Um, as a result of that, sort of by surprise, uh, a bill came in the legislature um, called LD670, um, which... Uh, would require the state of Maine to establish guidelines for public buildings, um, bird safe guidelines. So how the, the buildings can be built in a way that uh, limits the risk to uh, migratory birds and other wildlife. Um, this We passed this bill and Maine is now just one of four states uh, around the nation that has any sort of statewide um, look at uh, bird safe architecture. Um, we've just begun the process now of implementing this bill, and we're working with the state and partners in Portland and around the state to develop really um, robust guidelines that will help Maine be a be a, a national leader, really, in uh, in this field. And so um, we are really proud uh, of this bill, and um, and uh, we're glad to see it go through. And finally, for me, LD. 649, this is a very cool bill related to our Bringing Nature Home program. We know that one of the best things you can do for birds is plant native plants in your backyard or anywhere nearby because native plants uh, provide homes for the insects that birds need to raise their babies, caterpillars, and they also provide food in other seasons. Um, some folks don't want you to plant the things you want. I'm looking at you, some homeowner associations. And so there was a sort of issue around the country where homeowners associations were not letting homeowners plant native plants. They were saying, you got to do some lawn or, or whatever they say. And um, there was a big fight in Maryland uh, where a homeowner said, no, I want to be able to plant these plants. And they won. And then we saw that up here in Maine and said, we need to avoid this fight. We're going to pass this bill that says that homeowners associations can't outlaw the, the planting of native plants in your yard. So we want to make sure that folks have the right to um, do what's best for wildlife in their backyards. So that's what we did. Um, if you want to learn more about our Bringing Nature Home program, you can um, look on our website for Bringing Nature Home. We have all kinds of information and, and when the season is right, all kinds of native plants for sale. So check it out and plant them um, with, a, with, a, <laughs> with ease now. Um, no, no one will get in your way. Okay. With that, we are on time, and I want to pause now for just a few minutes and see if folks have questions about these are the highlights from last session, the end of 2023. Um, I see a couple questions from Rob, and I'll ask the first one about the lead tackle ban. Um, how is the public being made aware of this ban? Oh, it's a great question from Rob, was it? Yeah, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Um, so it's an excellent question because it really – is education is really a huge part of this. As much as policy changes, we need to make sure that fishermen, et cetera, know um, about these changes. So thankfully we have a program in Maine called Fish Lead Free. And this is um, with, a, it's a collaboration between us, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, um, Maine Lakes, and um, a few other organizations that actually help not only get educational materials out to fishing organizations, out to docks, et cetera, but um, we have a website as well, a fishledfree.org. I think you can click on the main base tab. Um, but we've also got a voucher system in place. Um, so we understand that this, we don't want there to be barriers and people to, you know, being able to, to fish. And so if you need to get rid of your lead based gear now because of these changes, um, you can um, look out for vouchers that are available at, at fishing shows, et cetera, at sportsman's shows um, to, for every, I believe, ounce of lead that you turn in, you get a $10 voucher that you can use at several main base stores. So that's one example of, of many programs that we've got 
in the works to educate and then to help also um, lift that burden off of folks um, awesome. who have a lot of lead-based gear. Yeah. Thank you, Chess. Um, Rob is on fire right now. He comes back with another question about the Bird Safe Initiative, wondering if there's anything in the initiative that encourages manufacturers or homeowners to use bird safe glass in their single family homes. So I will say that the bill that we passed does not address single family homes, except that part of the goal here is to educate architects about this problem. Bird glass collisions is not something that is taught in architecture school right now. So you have all these architects coming out being unaware, not knowing, uh, you know, that uh, they're about reflective glass or um, or those issues. And so a side effect and a real benefit from any of the advocacy we can do around um, bird safe glass stuff is educating architects about the problem fundamentally. And that'll carry into their projects on, on any size uh, home. That said, bird safe Maine outside of this bill that we passed has a ha has a lot of resources about single family homes. We stock decals in our stores. We have information about um, strategies you can use to avoid or mitigate the problem um, and uh, other resources along those lines. So um, Maine Audubon certainly does encourage folks to take action at their single family homes, um, but uh, this bill was focused on um, uh, state funded buildings. Okay, if I stop right now, we are right on track. I love it. Uh, any last, I don't see any last questions. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Chess for the second half. Okay. Second half, we're focusing on the now. What I'm doing, what we're doing up at the State House this 2024 legislative session. This is the second session, right, of the 131st. And uh, we've got some really big topics, many of which are moving as we are talking right now today. Um, I had to leave a hearing early, for example. Um, there's just a lot moving even in the, the evening hours. So a lot's in flux. So we're going to focus on some big, bigger topics here. Um, but I'll just say over and over, look out for more updates from us and action alerts for ways to engage on all the topics that we're about to talk about moving forward. Um, so with that, a huge topic for us this session, look at all of these LD numbers, is land use planning. So every session has some themes, the big stories, and there are a couple different really major topics that our legislature will be handling this session, one of which is housing. And I'm sure you've been, if you've been catching up on the news and, and paying attention to things, you um, this isn't a huge surprise, right? So Maine needs a lot more housing in order to keep up with underproduction. Currently, we need 40,000 new homes um, just to keep up with um, uh, our current needs. And then by 2030, we need another 40,000. So that's a lot as we have a growing population in Maine as well. Um, more and more folks are coming um, to the state to live. So we are thinking really thoughtfully about where we want to build and where we want to develop and how we want to grow. So as communities in Maine and around the country, this is not a Maine-based issue, right, um, are working to address this urgent need for housing. We know that wildlife and wildlife habitat can suffer if development occurs either too quickly or without proper considerations or unintended impacts. Um, so growth, the growth that we need and the conservation that we also need can coexist and they must, but we really have to be smart about it. So several of our priority bills for this legislative session deal with exactly that. And this list, these are some bills that we're happy with some bills that um, we are working really hard to make better, some bills we are not happy with, um, and there's a little bit of everything in between. Um, so I never thought I'd spend about a third of my um, work up in the housing committee up at the state legislature, but that is where I have been. Um, so um, with that, um, I'll say too that a huge part of the um, puzzle here is planning. Right, We wanna make sure that we're being smart as we do this growing. So we wanna grow up, not out. We wanna think about compact development, mixed use development, making sure we've not got long windy roads leading out to our rural farmlands or um, other working lands. How can we do this in a really thoughtful and judicious way so that we meet our housing goals and our conservation goals? So that's the, the framing all the time. So a lot of the legislation is dealing with the importance of that planning element, making sure that towns have the technical assistance and guidance that they need in order to do this smart kind of planning, whether that's through funding, which that's 
that's a huge part of it, um, making sure that there is um, staff um, at the state level to help guide a lot of the work that towns want to do. And I'll lift up, highlighted here is beginning with Habitat, which is an incredible program housed within the um, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, which maintains data and maps about our really important natural resources and making sure that um, towns, for example, and individuals too, individual landowners, and even on a regional basis at really all levels, um, have the information that they need to protect special places, to protect places that are, are important for wildlife um, um, and beyond. So as I'm sitting in the housing committee, I'm always thinking about opportunities for programs like Beginning with Habitat to be imbued within a lot of the um, legislation that's being forwarded. So. I'll leave that um, there. There's, I, we could have an entire webinar on land use planning right now, um, but um, for the sake of all of our other wonderful topics, I'm gonna keep going. Um, another big one is aquatic invasive species. So we, um, invasive flora and fauna are invading Maine's lakes and rivers. So this is fish and then all different kinds of plants like um, different pond weeds and naiads, milfoils, and they are accidentally um, introduced most often by boats being moved from one water body to the next so that aren't being properly cleaned and drained and dried. Um, thankfully, as an aside to last session, we passed some really good legislation related to clean, drain, dry. Um, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done in order to make sure that um, that's happening properly, one, and two, that those that are helping to do that work um, uh, have the funding that they need in order to, um, it's a lot of volunteers who are doing this important work, so making sure that the funding is there on the um, boat launch level as well as the um, you know water body protection level, so making sure that our state agencies and the funds that are put in place to help address aquatic invasives are strong and intact. Um, so that this is a huge topic for us. Um, LD 1342, I'll lift up. Um, this would um, raise the sticker price of the Lake and River Sticker Protection Fund sticker that folks get when you put a Uh-oh, it's just, just frozen for me. Let me... Can someone in the chat tell me if Chess is frozen or if it's just me? Uh-oh. Okay, Chess is frozen. Let me text her, and then I will just take over. Uh, Chess. Uh, hold on one second. Ah, the good old days of things going wrong on Zoom. Oh, and I actually can't move the slides because she is moving the slides. Hold on a moment. We will figure it out. Um, I just got in touch with her, um, and we're going to figure it out. Oh, no, she's off. All right, everybody, check this out. I can do this with my hands. No, we're fine. She's going to come right back on. I'll let her in, and she'll keep going. Um, she's going to talk over now about ooh, some shoreland zoning stuff. This is going to be very exciting um, because... Um, a lot of us live on lakes and ponds in Maine, know how important shoreland zoning is. These are the rules that prevent folks from just cutting down uh, trees all the way to the shoreline. Um, Chess says she's working on getting back. Um, and keep our lakes uh, clean and healthy, right? Protect the water quality for loons. Here's Chess. We're back. Whoa, dramatic exit. I don't know where I exited, but... We did it. Um you, the sticker program. Okay. I had jumped into shoreland zoning. So I was just talking okay. about shoreland zoning. So um, if you want to pick up there, that's great. So I got to share my screen again, huh? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I saw the unstable thing pop up and thought, oh no, it's coming. <laughs> okay. Uh, we should be good. Thanks, Nick. Yep. So yes, 1342 is going to help um, increase that sticker price just even a tiny bit to help us deal with a really huge problem that's um, already a problem, but getting um, worse, unfortunately. So we got to do what we need to do there. Um, I'm not sure where you got with this, but I'm going to just jump in again. Um, another big topic, um, protecting shoreline. Um, so there's a few different bills here that cover a few different issues related to um, protecting that really um, important shoreland zone, which um, 
I'll start off with the first, and this is the, you know, the areas around lakes, uh, lakes and, and ponds. Um, and one LD379 created a stakeholder group um, to address um, potential policy initiatives that could be put forward um, to curb the um, impacts that high powered wake boats, which are new boats that are coming, are here um, in Maine currently that make really, really big waves um, for the purpose of wake surfing, which is a newer sport in the water sports world. Um, these really big waves, uh, when they make it to the um, shore line, um, they don't dissipate in the way that other powerboats waves do. So they cause more erosion. Um, they impact that really critical common loon habitat, as we know that, uh, especially the nesting habitat right along the edge of the shore, that's right where loons nest. So this is, um, you know, where our antenna go up here. Um, but um, there's also water quality concerns with, with wake boats as well, as they stir up sediment in ways that other boats don't. So uh, we need to think really thoughtfully about how we um, allow for these new kinds of high powered boats um, on our, our lakes and ponds. So uh, I, we convened a couple times this summer. Um, it was folks from the boating and marine community, from the water quality, from state agencies, from enforcement to you know wildlife us here. Um, and actually tomorrow afternoon, the um, state's wildlife agency will be delivering a draft of the report to the legislature's Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee um, of what we found, where there was consensus, where we need, where there was not consensus, because that always happens in stakeholder groups, but hopefully um, where there were moments of, of consensus, we will be able to forward some sort of legislation from the committee this session to deal with something um, here with wake boats. Uh, the other sort of flip of this is on really the more land focused side, um, and that has to do with um, shoreland zoning. So shoreland zoning rules generally on the state municipal level are really critical to protecting that water quality, common loon habitat, et cetera. Um, but they're not always enough, and sometimes people find ways around them um, or just um, uh, don't uh, deal with them in the ways that they're supposed to. And that's a really rosy way of putting it. Um, but right now we're seeing that as we got more and more people coming to Maine, more people are really interested in living on the, you know, the edges of lakes and ponds. And we're seeing that, you know, trees are being pulled out for beaches and um, folks are getting shoreland violations and then moving on to the next, you know, property that they might have. So it's just becoming a really big problem. Um, so um, these latter two, um, um, LDs here um, actually make it so that um, folks who have previous shoreland violations, you know, can't get future permits, um, at least for five years. Um, it takes away permits if people have them and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing with their, you know, permitting for development or whatever they're, they're up to. Um, and if they do violate um, their permit, there's actually um, one of these bills places a lien on that property so that the town doesn't have to absorb that cost. Because what we're seeing, especially in our lakes regions, is towns are now having to go and do this um, work of trying to revegetate or figure out how to, you know, protect this really critical and some and often sensitive um, um, areas, um, this zone, and it just becomes really exorbitant and expensive. Um, so this is a fair way to address this problem. So this is another huge topic area for us. Um, there's another bill here on the land conservation side of things, um, LD 1285, which would infuse um, two rounds of $10 million into the Land for Maine's Future Fund. And LMF for short is Maine's most successful land conservation program, um, lar in large part because it is so diverse and collaborative in nature. It brings together tons of different stakeholders from the working waterfront side um, to the conservation side, to the you know wildlife um, side um, and recreational side, et cetera. Um, and for historically, this program has been funded by bonds. So if you are an avid voter in Maine, you might recall over many years, right, that we've you've voted or you've um, you know hopefully voted in support of of passing LMF bonds. Um, and while that's great and well, that's actually really not a sustainable funding model for 
something like LMF, our most successful conservation uh, land conservation program. So big picture, we're thinking about ways to secure long-term um, and reliable funding for programs like LMF um, amongst others. Um, but this is a great bridge for the moment. So we we did some good, um, we got some good funding across for the LMF program in the previous legislature, um, but that is gonna run out. So this is just to help us get to the next stage so that we can think more thoughtfully about how we really keep this um, fully funded into the into the future. So this bill is currently on the appropriations table, which all the funding elements of bills really happen at the end of the legislative session. So stay tuned. Another um, topic area for us is the Wabanaki Studies Bill, LD 1642. Um, so um, big picture in 2001, Maine passed um, the original Wabanaki Studies Law, which um, required in statute that schools in Maine teach Wabanaki history, Wabanaki culture, etc. And that was great. And a commission came um, together to um, figure out, you know, bring the proper expertise um, that was needed um, to the table to make sure that that curricula was thorough, accurate, um, and being dispersed um, in ways that, you know, it would be really successful. Um, however many years later here, um, 23 years later, um, there's a lot of gaps, too many, um, not only in the ways in which things are being taught, but really that they're being taught at all. Um, so here's, you know, we've got, there's a lot of compounding factors here, of course, within the, the you know, and, and, and pains on the, the educational system generally, but this is really important. Um, and we are advocating for this bill as it brings together, it reconvenes that commission um, to figure out how we really deploy Wabanaki studies in schools, um, keep it well-funded and make sure that teachers have the resources, the accurate resources that they need. Um, to teach Wabanaki history and and um, culture. And, you know, another big picture here too is um, so much of what um, Wabanaki teachings are is based on, you know, living in relationship with lands, waters, and wildlife. And that is critical um, to the work that we're doing here and beyond. So any opportunity we have to advocate for more of this kind of thinking in main schools, um, we're going to be there. So um, this bill is being heard in a work session later this week, so we'll see um, where how funding is going um, for this one. So stay tuned. You might might get an action alert about this um, in the coming days. We shall see. Another Wabanaki bill, um, the Big Sovereignty or Self Determination Bill. Um, so I'm sure this is hopefully not the first time you've heard about this bill, and certainly not from us as a starter. As this is something very much. Um, that is a broad sweeping effort to recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Wabanaki nations. Um, so there was an effort last legislative session to um, forward an, a, a big bill to um, um, recognize the inherent sovereignty of the, the Wabanaki tribes. And um, that was not, that did not move forward. So this is an, a second attempt and we're still, um, this bill has not had its public hearing yet, so it will um, likely um, come up in the coming weeks. So stay tuned um, here. But um, again, big picture, um, more than 200 businesses, organizations from environmental and conservation to faith, to social justice, to public health, um, et cetera, um, support um, this effort to right this wrong and to forward a um, fair and just um, path um, where we um, we do right by our Wabanaki neighbors. So um, more on this one as well in the future. And another big um, bill for us is the Open Space Tax Credit Bill, LD 1648, which is actually what I came screeching in here from um, this is just this afternoon as there was an initial work session on, on this bill. Um, the open space tax credit program is one of many, uh, one of a few programs we have in Maine, which helps um, lower the um, value of property if a landowner does something special to that property. And in this case, for open space, it would be, you know, coming up with a plan. Um, well, if this um, bill moves forward in the ways that we are, are excited about, um, 
coming up with a plan to um, protect wildlife um, in um, a better and, and more sustainable way or to um, think about ways to protect your land for water quality, et cetera. And when you work on those plans with a state agency, um, your um, how your tax on that land is actually lowered. Um, your assessor will lower your taxes. So it's a great idea and it's exactly the kind of thinking we need as we are thinking about um, land conservation in general in Maine and making sure we're not just conserving for the sake of conservation, but we're doing it in really good and thoughtful and hearty ways. Um, so we've been working really hard on this bill and this is another um, sort of diverse coalition-wide effort. So this is just in need of a refresh to make sure that um, the credits that landowners get is um, uh, the incentives are, are bigger and better um, as they should be. So this is one that um, will likely be wrapping up in the next um, couple weeks. And I believe this is the last big one on the list. Uh, plastic pollution. So there are a couple plastics bills this session, but I'm just going to highlight this one for now, LD-295. Um, so we know, of course, that plastic pollution represents a huge significant threat to wildlife and, and seabirds in particular, right? Um, and this bill would make it so that um, plastic containers and plastic packaging that are marked as recyclable and they look like you can throw them into your recycling bin and then they go off and get recycled, but actually aren't recyclable in Maine, then we don't have those anymore. So it's a big idea, um, but there is a lot of support for it, which is great. This will make it so that our recycling processing centers in the state are not getting overloaded by what you know material that looks like it could be recycled, but it actually can't be. Um, it's breaking down machines and really gumming things up. So um, this is just going to make it so that, you know, the few plastics that can really be recycled are recycled in our state. Um, this bill has a hearing tomorrow morning. So that's the first thing I'll be doing in the morning is testifying in support of this bill alongside some public health and other environmental groups. Um, but this whole um, sort of area for plastics and beyond is called truth and labeling. Um, so uh, stay tuned on this one as well, but, um, and there are a few other plastic spills, but I think I'll leave it, I will leave it there. In tune and on time. Great job, Chess. Thank you for all the work. And, and folks, if it's not, I mean, it is clear, but Chess is actively doing this right now. She is up there pacing the halls of Augusta, uh, making sure our voice is heard. And, um, you know, as you saw from our earlier presentation, it's your voices that we're bringing up to Augusta. We can't do any of this stuff without your help. Um, and so please continue to, you know, subscribe to our action alerts. It, 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 it may seem like it's a small action, but taking action on those alerts actually matters. Because when you go in there and take an action, that means your legislature gets on their phone an email that says, hey, this thing that you maybe not have, maybe not thought that much about, I'm thinking about it. Your constituent, me, is thinking about it. And I want you to take one thing or the other. Um, um, it's really important to, to fill those things out. It just takes a second. So thanks for all that you've done and all you'll continue to do. Um, I want to pause for some questions. So um, the rest of this program now is just um, uh, questions. And so we got a couple in the Q&A now. If you've got others, please put them in there. Um, I will start for a question from Francis about sea level rise. Um, if you've been in Maine in the past couple of weeks, you've known that uh, coastal flooding um, and not coastal flooding, the flooding everywhere is a major issue. Um, what are we doing to uh, work on sea level rise? Um, you know, I'll, I'll mention a couple of things and Chess, maybe you can finish off. Um, we do a lot of work on sea level rise. You know, first of all, from one sort of um, indirect way, but direct way, uh, I think, all of our uh, climate change work is related to, to sea level rise, right? So everything we're doing to promote re renewable energy to make sure that we get off fossil fuels as soon as we can and get on to clean renewable energy, um, that is tackling sea level rise and all the other associated impacts with climate change. Um, we also have another a number of other programs. The one that jumps to mind right now is our uh, a program called Stream Smart. Um, Stream Smart is a program that my colleague um, Sarah Haggerty is pretty much the leader in. Um, this is um, facilitating uh, the the safe passage of large amounts of water through streams, right? So all across Maine, we have all these stream crossings, and most of the time, 
there's just this tiny little culvert that um, is responsible for getting the water through. That's bad for a lot of reasons. It's bad for wildlife because they can't often get up that culvert to migrate and, and move where they need to go. It's also bad for flooding because those culverts are easily overwhelmed and things. And so StreamSmart is a program that works to replace those tiny culverts with much larger naturally wildlife friendly um, uh, culverts or bridges so that uh, water can move more easily and wildlife can move more easily as well. Um, we also work in the legislature. Um, although, you know, Chess may know what's going on in this legislature. Um, uh, one, another thing that jumps to mind is in uh, May 2023, so a year ago, uh, we passed a bill to um, facilitate, to finalize some rules for um, coastal protection. Um, it basically gave, gives homeowners tools to help them uh, plant native vegetation. Um, and to facilitate sort of uh, natural dune movement in, in the beaches in front of their houses, uh, which is great for sea level rise um, and great for piping clovers that nest on the beaches down there. Chess, anything to add? Yeah, I that was great, Nick. Thank you for the background. The current context, right, I mentioned at the, the top of the second half of the presentation that there are themes to the legislative sessions. And while housing is one of them, I'm seeing that dealing with coastal and even inland flooding related events is becoming another really big theme, at least of this, um, the last week, two weeks, three, three weeks even, um, and beyond. So um, this is really on people's minds. Um, legislators are walking through the state house halls with photos on their phones that constituents have sent them of their homes um, up against the coast or even, you know, up in Western Maine that have, are dealing with flooding in their basements, et cetera. It's really on people's minds. Um, so in that, with that said too, the um, legislature convened, reconvened the Coastal Caucus, um, which is a subgroup of legislators along or, or caring about the coast. It doesn't have to be in their district, but they're, you know, intrigued about how they can support efforts to deal with flooding um, events. So I was brought into that group to talk a little bit about what everything Nick just shared about what Maine Audubon does, because we, everything's a balance that we're doing here, you know, from housing to renewable energy, et cetera. You know, we need to think really thoughtfully about what legislation we put forward to address flooding impacts, to make sure that there aren't ripple effects that impact, you know, people, wildlife, et cetera. So that's where my framing is when I come into those conversations. And I expect, given that um, a lot of the Climate Council meetings are happening right now, the Maine Climate Council, um, one of which was, you know, convened, at, at, it was an emergency meeting this afternoon um, to really talk about the flooding um, issues. So um, very much on people's minds. I expect that we will see legislation. We already have seen a couple bills put forward um, from um, a few state agencies that we've been working with them to make sure that, you know, we've got safeguards in place to, um, to make sure we're dealing with, you know, public safety issues related to flooding, um, but also thinking about, um, you know, long-term impacts to habitats and et cetera. So um, I'll, I'll wrap it there, but very much right. on people's minds. Next question, another one from Rob about the lay of the land on Wabanaki studies bill. Is there, is there pushback or what do you, what do you envision happening there? It's a great question, Rob. So um, it's, Currently looking um, like funding, which is really the case with every um, bill, um, not every bill, but every a lot of bills at least, um, is a big issue. Um, so we have some ideas to try and find some funding um, to make sure that this commission can come back together um, to address, like I said, the many gaps in the, the program's um, deployment and then um, curricula generally. So that's the big that's the talk right now is how are we going to make sure that this um, this can get funded, this work. Um, we'll know more later this week. Um, I think we might not have mentioned too, but all the bills that got carried over from the first legislative session, they're usually the bigger bills, the trickier bills, the ones maybe they just ran out of time. There's kind of a spread for why, why they get carried over. But the legislature has put in a, a rule here that they need to report out. So every committee needs to vote on these carryover bills by the end of the month, which is why everyone is double, triple, quadruple booked up at the state house um, this month in particular. So um, 
this bill, we should really know more because um, uh, it is a, a carryover bill um, by really the end of the month. So stay tuned on that as well as you know a lot of our legislation. Great. Um, there's a question from Dina, and I, I'm trying to get a little clarification. She's, she wants to know about how well current protections are enforced. Um, I wasn't sure if uh, she had a specific area. And maybe while we're waiting for some clarification, um, Chess, can you talk a little bit about the just the timeline uh, of this session and and um, how long we're <laughs> how long we're doing this? How long? Yes. <laughs> Um, it's on my mind a lot. So it's a great question. Um, so I kind of just gave you a little flavor of like this month is really hectic. Lots of committee meetings, public hearings, work sessions to get those carry over bills um, reported out of committee voted on and then they go to the full legislature for their votes. So um, there have I think there were. Uh, with the new additions were somewhere in the 60s or 70s of new bills, probably actually more with agency bills now. 70s, 80s, 90s for new legislation um, for this session. Um, so we'll have more public hearings um, in work sessions into February and March on those new bills for this session. And we'll get more in as the governor can put a bill in whenever she she wants to. Um, so we'll, we can respond and, and support or, or figure out how to, you know, improve or what have you, depending on what she puts forward. Um, you know, flooding is on my mind. I think we're going to see some flooding legislation. So um, we're kind of waiting for things to pop up, but the flow really everything should end in April. Um, should <laughs> I don't I haven't heard of one that really has ended on time lately. Um, so and that's really why there's such a rush right now. This January work is because the last legislative session bled into the end of July, which was way over. So this is a short session. Um, we had our long session last time, so it it really should end toward April, end of April. Thank you. Um, we did get some clarification on the um, protections. It's very general. So current environmental protections in Maine, are they well enforced? Are there room for improvements? You know, I would say yes and yes. I would say that, um, you know, Maine is a state that takes its environmental protections very seriously. We're very proud of um, the way the state looks and the, the model it is for other states. And so, um, overall, and there's a lot to this question, um, this state is is fairly well protected, I would say. And we we do uh, thanks in large part to to you all and, you know, the work that Chess does and all our partners. Um, are there room for improvements? Of course, of course. And I would say a lot of that has to do with, you know, getting state agencies the funding they need to have people on hand who can enforce um, the protections. Uh, I worked for a while for when I, I interned for the DEP in their enforcement division when I was in law school, and it's a lot of work, um, and you have to do a lot to make sure that the, that the environment is protected. Um, it takes people to do it. It takes money to do it, and so um, those two things are, are in short supply always. So, um, Chess, I don't know if you want to, to jump in on that. or I just want to highlight the last thing you said there. Um, we passed great legislation. We've got really strong environmental protection laws in Maine. And when we send a mandate off to an agency and they don't have the staffing, they don't have, so that capacity, they, you know, to be very frank, they pay in Maine for a lot of our natural resource agencies and beyond does not compare to other states. So we end up losing a lot of good people. Um, so retention's a huge problem um, as well. I think that's one in one in four um, um, um Positions, thank you, gosh, positions in Maine is um, currently vacant. That's not good. <laughs> so I'm advocating a lot as well as our other environmental and conservation partners all the time to make sure that our folks at natural resource agencies, in particular, that's our focus, right, um, are, are getting the support that they need in order to do this really good work um, that we already have in place and that we're trying to get established into the future. Awesome. Couple minutes left. I see a couple more questions here. One is a, a great comment from Linda, uh, a visual art instructor um, who said great things about um, some time that she had on a seminar involving um, uh, Wabanaki studies and how she uh, had a great time there, was very motivated and encourages us to push this bill, get this bill passed. Uh, we can't agree with you more. Linda, I'm glad you ha had that great experience. 
Um, a question here from Daniel about the Force Advisory Board bill. Mm. You, you want to talk about that, Chess? Yeah, great. Thanks, Daniel. So that's maybe LD... explain it before. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I gotcha. LD993. Um, so this would establish a forest advisory board um, that would bring together a um, diverse group of stakeholders. Um, you know, folks with the wildlife focus, recreation focus, um, folks um, in the forest products um, um, realm, et cetera, to the table to help really implement strong and um, thoughtful um, you know, thinking at the programmatic level and also um, implementing for policies um, at, for our forestry practices in Maine. And there are a lot of stakeholder groups that are like this for other agencies. DMR has a stakeholder, um, uh, for an advisory board rather. Um, so does IFNW, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has an advisory board, but we don't have one on the forestry side. So um, this has been sort of a gap in that, you know, we really need to put our best heads together as Maine has some of the most important forests in, um, you know, East Coast and beyond, um, you know, temperate intact forests, like uh, it's in incredible habitats and species that, you know, we, we need to be thinking really thoughtfully about that protection. And I know we're running up on seven. So I'll just say that that bill is currently sitting on the appropriations table with a small fiscal note, it's only $5,000. So um, we are getting some pushback um, about, you know, how this advisory board would actually work and function. Um, and we're working on it. And we've got some really good um, partners um, in the you know, forest conservation space um, who are leading the effort, but we are there in a supporting role as much as we can be. And it's seven o'clock. Whew. We got through all the questions. We did it. Um, Chess, thank you so much for all the work you are doing and continue to do and we'll be doing nonstop, sorry, for the next couple of weeks. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I really appreciate you coming on, learning about what we're doing, uh, making your voice heard for Maine Wildlife. We can't do any of this without you. Um, thanks for everything. Let us know if you have questions at any time. Uh, advocacy at mainaudubon.org is a great way to get in touch with us. And uh, we'll see you out there. Take care, everyone. Have a great night. Night, everybody. Thanks so much.